Hi, everybody. Can you, can you hear me? Okay, um, this paper was intended to be the start of a literature review for my dissertation. And this topic interests me because as a first-generation American Latina growing up in Miami, I was always conflicted by the dietary principles that we were taught in school. You know, this isn't how we were eating at home. Are we doing something wrong? Um, though I have a very resilient grandmother and very healthy family, so, but U.S. is the home to advanced sciences, so who's right? Um, and what we eat at home sure tastes better than um, what the government's telling me to eat. So, um, you know, so this topic kind of helps justify, you know, that's why I'm in this field. Um, it interests me because I want to kind of put to terms what I was coming up with growing up. And I should mention that my master's is in statistics and my bachelor's in math, so you might see along the way that I tend to think along that way. Uh, so first I want to say I appreciate that this conference has both interest in the popular and in the scientific, so I hope that my talk um, can balance out nicely. And I want to applaud the Ancestral Health Society also for taking the bold step of inviting other sciences to the conference this year. I think it's a great step in the right direction to um, make the movement less fragile. So today, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna do this in four parts. I wanna talk about how nutri uh, nutrition science today is a flawed lens when it comes to food scholarship, then inviting ancestral wisdom to the party, that is the scientific community, in discussions of validity and reliability, and how to best frame scholarship, hence policy and end with the possible American food culture of tomorrow. So um, back in the 1600s, we had uh, Rene Descartes who was um, having the problem of trying to get, trying to re revolutionize science because back then it seemed to be the church and the king that would dictate what the truth was. So um, his study involved questioning assumptions, taking no assertion on faith, and building our understanding of the world on provable observations rather than tradition. So now we have uh, nutrition science, or you've heard the term nutritionism, where food is really just based on its components. Um, the, uh, and it has the assumption that food and living beings are independent of time and space. So I bring up Descartes because I think we found our, ourselves um, kind of similar to where he was back in the 1600s. Okay, that's okay. So um, Descartes, his reorientation of knowledge so that it was no longer based on collective authority, what the king decrees, what the church demands, but on a newly empowered self, the individual mind and its good sense became a starting point for the development of democracy, psychology, and much else that we think of as modern. So, I don't know if you see where I'm going, but it's not a king or a church now, but, um, well, definitely politics has a lot to do with how nutrition policy is formed. But it seems that the school of nutrition pretty much has taken that role. If you're in academia, you can probably sense that um, bureaucracy has a lot to do with what you study in and what you can end up publishing. Um, so my assertion here is the myopic lens of nutrition sciences, it holds an inferred validity across academic, scientific, and popular writings on food. And um, so I see ourselves like in this position now and to get scholarship that actually found uh, productive policy so that health, can really take off and we can get ourselves out of this rut, I think it has to be approached, um, the scientific community and particularly the dependence on the nutrition science lens. So my paper was a literature review and these are some of the um, authors in academia that I covered. Rhea Tannehill, she says, in the matter of dietary principles, so much was going on that the average person had little opportunity of finding out what was going on and so fell in the way of accepting without conscious thought 
what was initially presented as the new scientific certainty of the 1970s and 1980s. So here you see the public taking assertions on faith. When they tell us to watch for calories, watch for carbohydrates, watch for proteins, that's not something you can actually feel or you know, regard when you're eating food. So you have to take that leap of faith to try to develop how best to eat. So um, these kinds of policies had, policies have failed to stem the tide of these food-related chronic disorders that we're seeing now. So, um, and it also has led to detrimental unintended consequences, which I'll go over in just a, a bit. So um, my argument is we need some kind of science that can underlie these policies that we can be in on how the best way to eat is instead of relying, well, how many calories is that? How do we know by looking at a box? Is really that the best way to feel like we've made the right choice? <laughs> Another quote. Rhea Tannehill, in an, inter in an increasingly intricate world, even simplification that is perfectly well-intended can deteriorate into oversimplification that is not only misleading, but occasionally dangerous. So um, the following is an example. I was at a meeting, and there were a lot of dietitians at this meeting. They were discussing a John Hopkins course that showed a pie chart, and the pie chart showed the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted by different modes of food production. So meat was number one at 30%. Then the discussion from that came to be about uh, trying to promote more programs like Meatless Mondays so that we can decrease the consumption of meat. But can anyone here see an alternative argument to this 30%? Well, what if we ate the whole animal? instead of just the lean muscle meat. Who's telling us to eat just the lean muscle meat? So what is the rest of the cow go? So do you think their own um, suggestions are underlying this 30%? Did they argue that? No. And another thing about that while I'm on that track, <laughs> they tell us to pick fish over meat. Well, that's great if you like fish, but honestly, if you like fish, you should go live on the coast. That's where you'll get the best of it. But that choice, when you really want meat, but you should eat fish, what's it doing to our oceans? So there's a lot of unintended consequences that I believe result from policy based solely on nutrition sciences that aren't being articulated in the academic community or even in the popular community. So ancestral wisdom as valid. This is also Rhea Tannehill. She was one of my, she had the best quotes, really. Food remains as essential and divisive as it has ever been. And the comfortable belief that the world's diet is no longer at the mercy of nature and human ignorance is not as solidly founded as it might seem. History shows that despite the long millennia of human development, it is only the social context that has changed. And this is where my social science training comes in. Food is a social phenomenon. All scholarship should regard this. In the paper, I utilize the term omniscient knowledge, which I mean by ancestral wisdom. The repository of this wisdom is found in social constructs, like traditional food cultures. The academic resistance toward framing food as social, um, hence inviting a context of ancestral wisdom, it, it's because it's not straightforward to measure and um, also because it's framed as a matter of aesthetics or nostalgia. So in this lit review, it was the historians and an anthropologist who, who took a very defensive tone. It's like um, they describe food with an inherent complexity, and it should have that. Um, and they also kind of insinuated you cannot structure the field with linear thought. Another comment to that regard, uh, Sidney Mintz, He's an anthropologist. What constitutes good food, like what constitutes good weather, a good spouse, or a fulfilling life is a social, not a biological matter. So um, I'm gonna touch on the validity, validity and reliability of um, the concepts of ancestral wisdom. Rhea Tannehill, all that the 19th and 20th century have done is identify the scientific factors that enable ancient ideas and techniques 
to be successfully translated into practice, not just sometimes, but always. So, um, again, food has to be understood as social. That's how we access the wisdom of the past. Um, what she's implying is that now that science puts this into practice, all of a sudden they believe, wow, they've just discovered something. But that validity existed in the past, like the creation of fire, say. And um, being able to lab situate it in that white laboratory, it allowed scientists to kind of usurp the credibility of a discovery that probably was utilized in one form and another for many, many, many thousands of years. So again, ancestral wisdom is valid. Uh, Rhea Tannehill warns thousands of years of history are not to be shrugged off in a few decades. Now, excuse me, Laura. There we go. So the validity aspect of it. Um, one could argue that thousands of years of practical applications as well as independence from modern research constraints such as funding obligations, IRB authorizations, and even academic discipline bias um, contains, if, contains equal if not superior validity than the scholarship being advanced today. And in statistics they teach you something called the central limit theorem. And one idea is that, say, um, the infinite amount of practical applications that have happened over time, even though they were in control, they were not in a laboratory, the central limit theorem provides that they all converge into a true population mean, or in this case, what I believe is an absolute truth. So one of these concepts from the past that I'm talking about is like the concept of eating together. Throughout history, as we built communities, we've eaten together. So some commentary on that, these authors who I said were very defensive about contemporary eating habits kind of violating those concepts from the past. This is Felipe Fernand, um, pardon me. Oh, I'm sorry, one more note about the validity aspect. Jessica Mudry, she's a communications professor. She says the very language that we use now biases it against uh, ancestral wisdom. For example, she says, Present food studies lacking discourse deriving authority from history, geography, and experience. That's ancestral wisdom. And also, it has demonstrated the ways in which the food system has been bent to serve the interest of global capitalism, and it distorts the rhetorical force of alternative discourse. So, she brings up a great point. When we talk about milk, when we talk about meat, when we talk about fruits and vegetables, where are the adjectives? The adjectives are organic. The adjectives are grass-fed. They're unpasteurized. But that's how we've always done it. So what the modern uh, commercial culture has done is they've hijacked the, the social comfort of being considered the normal. That means the ancestral has to defend itself to exist. So that's very important. If you have to have the adjective to be understood as uh, um, for what you are, you're the other, which makes it harder to come into mainstream culture. So the concept of eating together. Felipe Fernando Armes Fernandez Armesto, he said on the socialized distancing from cooking, cooking was a precious invention because of the way it forged community. Contemporary eating habits threat to unpick this achievement. Food on the fly feeds the values of hustle, nourishes the anatomy of post-industrial society. The loneliness of the fast food eater is uncivilizing. On the liberating aspect of the microwave, no reference of community, uh, to community of taste needs to be made. No matriarch or paterfamilias has an opportunity to ar arbitrate for a family. No one in a household has to defer to anyone else. Moreover, no two people need to eat at the same time or table. This new way of cooking is staggeringly counter-revolutionary. It reverses the cooking revolution which made eating sociable and returns us in this respect to a pre-social phase of evolution. So one of those intended consequences of um, basing our food policy on nutrition sciences, which is independent, it's a thought that food is independent of time and space, 
we're moving backwards. And this, um, where I want to go now is where I hope to extend this study is I think there's exciting research behind epigenics, which is um, when genes express themselves based on the surrounding nutritional environment, and uh, the science behind the gut microbiome. That all, I, I feel, complements what I'm doing here. So um, this quote that I got from the book Epidemic of Absence, he talks about how we're kind of destroying the microbe environment by being too sanitary. He says, the extinction spasm we are now inflicting can be moderated if we so choose. Otherwise, the next century will see the closing of the Cenozoic era, the age of mammals, and a new one characterized not by new life forms, but by biological impoverishment. It might appropriately be called the Eremozoic era, the age of loneliness. Well, in the, um, in the literature review, these academics and the other writers also kept pointing, if we keep eating the way we are now, we're going to become solitary, we become lonely. This concept of loneliness and enemy was very um, prominent throughout. So some um, examples of these quotes that um, show that same kind of uh, idea that we're going to cope backwards. We are beginning to seem far more savage in our way of eating than our prehistoric ancestors. And that was Carlo Petrini, who's the father of slow food. But fast food has no ethnic identity. Its only genes are plastic and sterile. Well, what's plastic and sterile? It's microbe-free environments. There's no, there's no feeling, there's no blood, there's no um, history there. So, moving on. Okay, so something I, that um, our population is gonna start coming to that I haven't heard mentioned in this conference, the demographics are changing. We're going, in just a couple generations, we're going to be hugely influenced by the Latino and Asian cultures. Well, the thing about Latino and Asian cultures is they have a strong food tradition. So when you try to present to them policy that's based on food science that is removed from time and space, I think it's gonna be a little bit more difficult when you have a population that's coming from a grounded food tradition. And one of the ideas of um, why I say the bacterial research is fantastic you still can't be base policy on how much lactobacilli to get that day or you know, grab a hookworm or two to put it in your body to stay healthy, but you can base it on intimacy. You can base it on dependency. Eat together, share a plate, cook together, don't use a straw. You know, and that may very well help. Its unintended consequences may be helping the environment. So, um, how I want to end here is on an, actually an optim, optimist note. The way at least Latinos learn how to eat is by seeing, is by feeling, is by feeling good when you sit down with your family. And one of the restaurants in Miami that I always go to is called Palacio Los Jugos. And this fruit display right here you can see on the left, right behind it they serve unpasteurized um, South American pulp fruit juices. Delicious. There are no desserts at the forefront. And there's not even a menu, and that's my kid drinking out of a coconut. <laughs> so that's something that is normal there. It's not the adjective. It's normal. That's how you eat. This is a place you go to dinner. It's outdoors. There's no play place. You eat with your family. And is there a menu right above your head in black and white with calories and what's heart healthy or not? No, this is your menu there. That's what's right next to that fruit bar. You go with what you know, with what's been cultivated over time, with what feels familiar to you. And that's where you choose from. My kid didn't bug me for uh, desserts, for flan, for an ice cream, for a shake. He wanted chicken. He saw this, he wanted chicken. So in conclusion, on a good note, I have hope that the new demographics will inspire a robust American food culture that will move us forward into a new age of enlightenment where food policy will ensure its citizenry with the optimal potential of resilient health and longevity. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. We actually are into lunchtime, um, so if you have questions for Carla, you can ask her during lunch. I hope those pictures started the digestive juices going.